everybody, and thank you all for coming today. I'm going to talk about the Cthulhu mythos uh, in epistemological perspective, and if you don't know what some of those words mean now, you hopefully will by the end of the talk. So, first, who is Cthulhu? Cthulhu is one of the elder gods, the most popular elder god. If you've heard of any of them, you've probably heard of Cthulhu. This is Nier Lathotep, this is Azathoth, um, but Cthulhu is the one that everyone seems to have learned. And they all appear fairly terrifying, but the whole point of them isn't that they are physically terrifying, it's that they are inhuman. So they are cosmic entities of unthinkable power. Um, we cannot comprehend how powerful they are and what they can do. Uh, and they often appear to be evil because of what they do, but they aren't. They don't have any concept of good or evil that we could come to understand. They're Morals and motivations are far beyond our scope of our ability to process. Um, and with that in mind, they're inherently inhuman. We can't attribute motivations or desires or emotions to them that we can understand. They are as far removed from us as like grains of wheat are from humanity. So they come primarily from Lovecraft, who is an early 20th century writer. Um, he's the father of the cosmic horror genre, uh, where the other gods normally reside. And he basically created these creatures in his stories to present something that reduced humanity to nothing more than something that is. We are not something that has meaning or has a purpose or does things. We are just something that exists. Um, he was an apatheist, which is basically a term um, for a form of agnostic who believes not just that we can't prove whether God exists, but that it doesn't actually matter whether God exists. Like if there is a God, it doesn't, it should not affect our actions or choices in any way. And that definitely affected the way he wrote. Uh, the elder gods are not gods in a religious sense. They are entities that reduce humanity um, to something that is not, uh, they don't care about being worshipped. They don't care about being feared. They don't care about anything we do. Um, they just make their own actions and choices on a plane of existence that is far beyond our own plane. Um, and the point of Lovecraft's stories is to remind us of our own insignificance. Um, he, he himself was relatively insignificant in his own lifetime and would be very surprised that so many of us know his name today. Um, he was most well known among his contemporaries who also wrote unusual things. He's not the only person who wrote about what are now known as Elder Gods. Uh, Robert W. Chambers wrote uh, a little bit, probably about 10 years before Lovecraft wrote most of his stuff. Um, about the King in Yellow, um, also known as Hastor, and it's ambiguous whether Hastor is an entity that moves around, or is a city, or is both, or all of these things. Its existence isn't something that is confined to human perceptions of existence. Uh, and Lovecraft definitely took that theme and ran with it with his own creations. And then August Derleth was kind of an understudy of Lovecraft, and Derleth popularize the Elder Gods, he kind of made a pantheon out of them, and in fact reduced them more to the Greek gods or something of that nature than what Lovecraft envisioned them to be. Um, but he also, he helped catalog them, and a lot of the reasons why they continued in the public knowledge is because of Derleth's work. Um, so, what is cosmic horror? Uh, why is it horror, and what makes it cosmic? Uh, Lovecraft said that the fundamental premise of his tales is that common human laws and interests um, have no validity or significance in the vast cosmos at large in the universe. Um, what we do seems to matter a lot to us, but to an outside observer, like an elder god, means nothing at all. Um, so it focuses on the insignificance of humanity and that's where the horror comes in. The monsters look gribbly, they have tentacles and like lots of fangs or eyes, um, but that's just meant to emphasize their otherworldliness, the fact that they are not human, they're not something that exists at all on this planet. Um, the actual horror in Cosmic Horror comes from the forced realization 
of the unimportance of everything that you want or do. Uh, it's a kind of intellectual horror more than it is a chainsaw, blood and gore kind of horror. So, sudden break to epistemology. Um, as you might have guessed from what I've told you about Elder Gods and cosmic horror, human knowledge is, is tiny, is less than a grain of sand um, compared to the scope of the universe. And the study of epistemology is the, the study of knowledge, of how we can gain knowledge, what that knowledge means, and how much knowledge we can have. Um, a lot of it focuses on distinguishing justified beliefs like scientific theories from opinions, like I like this flavor of ice cream better than that kind. Um, so if you know who Kurt Gödel is, you might be wondering why did I put a mathematician on a slide about epistemology, and it's primarily because of his incompleteness theorem. So in the early 20th century, around the same time as Lovecraft was writing, uh, there were a group of mathematicians who wanted to make a complete set, a complete theory for the relationships between natural numbers. Um, and they put a lot of time and energy into this and made huge works and lots of papers. Uh, and Gödel came along and was like, not only is your theory incorrect, you cannot have this theory. In any system of natural numbers, there are things that will be one true and two unprovable. You must simply accept them and you cannot prove that they are true in any reasonable sense, um, which a lot of other mathematicians were very unhappy about, but as we moved further into the century, people saw that Gödel's theorem was in fact correct, and a lot of his work now underpins uh, mathematical studies that are done today. So this plays along the same theme that Lovecraft's writings do. Um, because it focuses on the fact that we cannot know some things and we simply have to accept them. And that's the point of the other gods. They're there in the stories. You can't really fight them. You can't in any way affect them. You can't make them angry or afraid. You can't make them happy. You just have to accept what they do and try to survive regardless. Um, and in a way that paralleled a lot of the mathematical and scientific discoveries of the age. Um, so. We can't comprehend infinities. We approximate them. We try and deal with them. We try and make calculations that use them, but we can't truly comprehend them. Like, If somehow a comprehension of the vastness of the universe were put into our minds, it, we would probably go insane. Um, and in the same sense, I have this uh, sine of theta is approximately theta. And anyone who's done intro physics has probably seen this equation. It's for an appropriately small theta you can approximate sine of theta to be theta. And that's a very simple example of what happens in science and math everywhere. We approximate so many things because it takes too much time to compute, or we simply can't um, get an exact value for things. Uh, and this, again, is something that when you're doing science and math, you have to come to accept. And I actually, when I started doing this stuff in college, it bothered me that I couldn't get an exact value. Like, why do I have to make these approximations? But if you're going to get any answer at all, you're forced to accept it. Um, and this theme of acceptance is what Elder Gods are about, about accepting your own insignificance, about accepting your inability to be precise, and inability to be perfect, um, that was radical at the, in the first half of the 20th century, because at the time, a lot of people believed there was perfection, that we were moving towards perfection. Physicists, before the quantum revolution, thought that they knew everything there was to know, and it was just a matter of time that they could use that knowledge to make whatever they felt they needed to make. Um, and then uh, Heisenberg and the others came along and said, no, actually, there's a lot we still don't know. So. It's been 100 years since that age, and the Cthulhu mythos, uh, as I mentioned, is a lot more popular now than it was at the time. Uh, it's, there are board games for it, there are role-playing games for it, it's influenced a lot of other um, aspects of, of gaming popular culture, or uh, I guess you could call it nerd culture in general. Um, but one thing that these games miss is that in the original stories, you're, you're not 
really fighting other gods because you can't. You would just lose. They, their power is far beyond our ability to like prick them with a pin. Um, in a game, of course, you have to have a way to win and lose. But we know we've lost that aspect of we cannot affect them and they don't care about us. Most of Lovecraft's stories um, actually are telling of something that happened beforehand from a survivor. Like, this is what happened to my family or this is what happened at the house on the edge of the village I was raised in. And there's no, there's no attempt to be a hero and close the portals from which the Elder Gods are reaching into your world. That's just not an aspect of the stories. Um, and there's one other thing that makes the Elder Gods really interesting in the 21st century. And it's that we have so much more technology now than we have in centuries past that to a man living 300 years ago, we are gods. Like what you can do with your phone or by flying in an airplane, you become a god. They wouldn't believe that we could do that. They would think we were witches or had some supernatural power. Um, and in a way, we understand that we're not gods and we're, we're not omnipotent or anything, but we might seem like it to someone else. We've created technologies and systems that elevate us to the level of little gods, which means that our systems, our corporations, and our satellite networks, these are elder gods to some degree. They are extraordinarily powerful entities that are not under the control of any one human and affect everybody's life. And to someone who didn't know what made those networks, they would seem like elder gods, like something magical and incredibly powerful. Um, so what makes elder gods fascinating is that there aren't just natural entities beyond our control, but in fact entities that we ourselves create. Corporations, I would hazard a guess that the people who sit on the board of Google don't know everything that goes on in Google. Um, and the same goes for any large government or business. Um, we make networks always that hopefully help us but are inherently outside the control of an individual and we have to accept that. We have to continue to exist and to build and create while acknowledging the fact that there are powers that are very close to us that could very easily destroy us if they chose to. Um, and in a way that's terrifying and in a way it's kind of exciting. Um, because these, these gripply monsters that we read about in Lovecraft's stories, the ones that exist in, in our world today, so many of them are of our own creation. So while we may be insignificant and while we may have very limited knowledge on an individual level, as a society um, and as a, as a species moving forward, we are in a way creating gods of our own. Uh, which is why I personally love Lovecraft's stories. Maybe I'm too optimistic in the way I read them, but I really appreciate the fact that they remind me of my own place in the universe and the own ultimate insignificance of my actions, but at the same time, they reinforce my understanding that as, as a society, we're able to create entities like these. So that is the Elder Gods and how they are a reflection of the way we deal with knowledge as a species. Ah!